Hi, uh, my name is Sally Stein. I'm here to greet you and to moderate this conversation, as well as at the end, if people want to ask about the curating, I am the guest curator, Maya Copa, or Maya Copa. Um, and um, we're, we're have, we ultimately have organized four conversations. Uh, the first one at the time of the opening was simply about um, Gail's procedures, the, the social art, the social orientation in the art of Gail Rivan. Um, and we then had a conversation about uh, largely first generation uh, artists uh, bridging old and new worlds. Today's conversation, and because that's also very relevant to Gail's work, we then had a, uh, we're now having a conversation which is really about issues of feminism and especially the issue of women, the draw and drawbacks of women artists who deal with families, with their family ties. Mm -hmm. To what extent it becomes a subject of their work, it enhances their work, it becomes a subject of avoidance traditionally. And um, so what are the draws? and how it's been worked, as Gail has worked it here, and also um, what have been the historic drawbacks of women artists being associated with reproduction and children, uh, let alone also with uh, aging parents and caregiving, both at the front end and at the back end. Um, today, um, and the, the last conversation, which is at the end of April, is going to be about uh, regarding urban flux, such as one sees in this work, which is veiled right now because of the screen. Um, but uh, Gail's interest in really thinking about uh, what's past and yet still haunts the present, um, and how we can uh, try to think about change, but also think about how the past impinges on us. Um, so that's at the end of April, April 29th, correct? <coughs> Sorry, I always have a little asthma, especially when I'm staying with, um, thanks to the hospitality <laughs> of Gail Redman and Mark Cashore, because they have a cat and I'm very allergic to um, Sorry about that. Today's guest speakers are Jenny Klein here, Lena Jayaswala, and uh, Gail Redman also, as well as Andrea Liss, who is in California, and because of her own family obligations, is not able to be here, but ask me to read and then ask me to respond to a short statement. Um, so I'll be um, Andrea's proxy presenter and then interlocutor at the end of this. Uh, and then we hope to both open it up here and open it up with you as well. So um, I'm going to make uh, longer introductions before each speaker. So I'll start with Jenny Klein. Associate Director and Graduate Director, School of Art and Design, Professor of Art History at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Um, she's an art historian who writes on contemporary art, performance art, and the intersection of gender and visual culture. And gender as it's gotten more and more complicated in recent years. And Jenny really stays up on this and writes prolifically about issues like uh, both um, genders in transition, people in transition between genders or embodying multiple genders. And also, uh, her most recent book, and I wish you brought a copy, I have to order one, is Ecosexual Feminism. No, I'll, I'll bring one. I'll send one to you. But it, it's, assuming, it's assuming the other, it's assuming, I don't know if it's working. Close. Oh, okay. It's assuming the ecosexual, ecosexual position, the work of um, Elizabeth Stevens and Annie Sprinkle, and I wrote it with them. So, yeah, I should have brought everyone a copy, but I travel light. <laughs> she does travel very light, but she deals with heavy, intense, provocative issues as well. Um, and when I heard about uh, the ecosexual position, I thought, I have no freaking idea what that is. <laughs> And I have to get this book because she's also great at explaining things to open up this new position for me. Um, in 2020 uh, appeared uh, one book project, uh, the first responding to site and co-edited with Dr. Natalie Loveless with Intellect Press. Um, it's a collection on the work of artist Marilyn Arson. The second book uh, appearing the next year, 2021, uh, assuming the ecosexual position, 
was published with the University of Minnesota Press and is a compilation of the work and writing of Annie Sprinkle and Elizabeth Stevens. Dr. Klein has published uh, with Performance Art Journal, or PHA, though I had to ask what is PHA, uh, Frontier's Journal of Lesbian Studies. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, feminist Studies in Paradoxa out of London, Frontiers, uh, excuse me, Art Pulse, Art Papers, New Art Examiner, Genders, and After Image. She's also had a blog, though it's become uh, fairly occasional, so she said, take that off. But it speaks to how absolutely prolific and wide-ranging she is. But the real reason we invited, invited her for today has to do with her very great book, which is still in press, The M Word. Uh, that she edited with Mer Meryl Sherlick and its real mothers in contemporary art. And it is truly a fabulous publication that um, would, it really opens up the range of uh, women artists who are mothers who are dealing with issues of motherhood in a true variety, a very diverse range of attitudes, practices, and kinds of works. Uh, and she's the editor, along with Deirdre Hedden, uh, Histories and Practice of Live Art. Um, and I'll stop there so she can start. Um, but you, she has an endless resume. You could just look me up, too. <laughs> um, so so um, this, is, this is me, professor of art history at Ohio University, trying to remember to hold the microphone close. I guess, can we have the first slide? So this first image is Baby 2 by Gail. And then hold it right here. For, no, you can go on to Mary Kelly, please, number two slides. So one, there's a couple of things I wanted to call to your attention regarding Gail's work. Um, now it seems to be advancing without, without you. But the first is that uh, Gail is often compared to Mary Kelly, uh, who is probably our best known artist who's dealt with issues around maternity when she did postpartum document. Um, on the left is Prima Parra, on the right is a part of postpartum document. And interrogated through Lacanian psychoanalysis, the kind of development that a mother had with their child. If we could go back to the first slide for a second. Um, obviously, this bears some resemblance to Prima Parra, but it's different. Instead of this kind of obsession with the child's face, there's more of a kind of sense of the work involved with the child. And there's a couple of things that are very interesting to me about uh, Gail's work, which I think often are overlooked because of the subject that she's dealing with. The first is that there's a real interest with the kind of labor, work, and stuff of being a mother, the, the kind of grinding work that often is not acknowledged. And the second is the way in which Gail is very much situated in a kind of Southern California pop culture conceptual milieu. <coughs> so I know um, Sally calls attention to Gail's um, kind of, um, compare or you know your your commonalities with Ed Ruscha and the gas stations and Santa Monica Boulevard and some of those other books that he made. And indeed, there's a kind of humor here, which is not very surprising since these two men in Southern California and um, Gail was going to CalArts. I don't think Rusche ever taught there, but John Bolisari was probably floating around at that time too. So let's go on to the next one and then the next one after that. So just a few um, photographs by Gail. Um, whoops, go back which um, I think there's, this one on the left is in the show, right? This one on the right is not. Um, well, a variation. A it's variation. From, it's from that series. It's from a longer series where right. they selected two here. So one of the things that Gail has done is made her life, her artwork, and again, there's a long, long tradition of this. Um, Linda Montano, of course, immediately springs to mind. Uh, but because Gail's life was being a mother as opposed to being a conceptual artist, again, we tend to lose the kind of trajectory that's being shown in this art. So on the left is her son's bedroom. Glad to see it's as messy as could be. But it's also kind of interesting anthropologically. And then on the right is the kind of 
post-party after effects of a 21st birthday celebration. Um, can we have the next slide, please? And then I also wanted to point out, this is just one of my favorites because it's so funny. Oops, go back for a second. Um, where Gail is watching her son play in a little peewee soccer game and overhears some mothers talking about the diversity of the neighborhood and just wonders what, what they're talking about and it turns out they're talking about Gail because she's Jewish. And so this is, uh, this is sort of, Gail has always actually made lots and lots of comments about issues around race and identity and um, I guess Race is, is now, we sort of understand it as a, as a construct and instead use the word ethnicity, but class and immigration and belonging. And this is a very funny way of doing this, especially if you are, um, if you do have children in a certain kind of socioeconomic environment, generally you have at least one of these team pictures floating around. <laughs> right and a participation trophy from the end of the team <laughs> event. Um, so we should, let's go on. I just, I'm just gonna add, my son is actually plays soccer professionally in Finland, so proud mama moment, but anyway, we have all a million of these. So if we can go on, I'm gonna go very quickly through the next group of slides. So these are some other artists that have dealt with labor. Um, this is Monica Bach, oops, go back from 1999 to 2000. And this is actually cast, um, paper bags of all the lunches that she made for her children. And she has the lunches written out, so she's very, very obsessive. And then going through uh, Nikki, she goes by Nikki's mind, was always how she would be judged by the lunches that her children took to elementary school. Um, some of us might have had that, uh, that experience as well. Next slide, please. This is by Judy Gellis, who was in the original Maternal Metaphors show and Maternal Metaphors 2. And she- Also in the M word. In the M word, yes. As Gail and, also was. Yes. I should have mentioned. Yes, and, as, and Sarah's in that book as well. And this is, once again, Judy took a, 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 a photography class and because she wanted to take beautiful pictures of her child and that there's a beautiful picture and, that this is a lot of Judy's early work was about the labor of having small children. Um, Judy sadly passed away a few years ago. The next slide, please. Um, this is sort of the original labor group, Mother Art, um, a compilation of their work between 1977 and 1981. Mother Art actually got going when a group of them joined the women's building and found out that mothers weren't welcome and kids were definitely not welcome and dogs were welcome, but the children had to stay out of the women's building. And so Mother Art built a playground with industrial schools that would probably be condemned right now. And they also did work about the laboring of mother, of, of maternity rather, and uh, this coat hanger, for example, refers to issues around um, reproductive freedom. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, more mother art. Next slide, please. Again with the coat hanger. Yes, again with the coat hanger, and it's a video of the washing machine. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is by Sarah Urban, who's become a probably second generation activist for mother art. And her uh, drawings were actually made by putting some kind of mark making material on the bottom of the rocking chair that she used to rock her daughter to sleep. And again, this is a literally a physical trace of the labor and the work. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, this is Mars Bustamante and Monica Meyer uh, from Madres. I forgot to put that. They used both labor and issues around um, identity to make statements about, again, reproductive freedom. Um, Monica Meyer was actually part of the women's building. Next slide. Uh, this is Patricia Quay, who's based in Southern California. A book that she made with her daughter called I Need, I Want. Um, Leah was very young, was really bothering her at the time, so she let him make the book with her so she could get her art done. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is Heather Gray from 2004, sort of playing on uh, the mother who's stuck at the home and who has nothing to do but drink and 
dress up. <laughs> the bad mother. What's that? The bad mother. Next slide, please. But of course, still a lot of work. She's tired. And this is Sarah Webb. Um, and Sarah, I'm afraid the title is off, but it's how to make blood and fat, or spat and blood. How to make fat and blood. Um, and of course, this is very intricately embroidered. And Sarah actually, I don't know if this, I don't think this work was particularly about this, but you did a very beautiful piece that was inspired by your mother-in-law's journey with breast cancer. Breast cancer. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was in the Maternal Metaphor show. So um, if you'd like to know more, um, Sarah has actually really lovely body of work and she's here. <laughs> Next slide, because I didn't want to go over my time. Um, so this is Natalie Loveless, my co-editor, who is also an artist. She received her MFA from the um, School of the Fine Arts at Boston and studied with Marilyn Parson. Of course, was the subject of our poetic book. And she has coined the term new maternalisms, um, where she's riffing on new materialisms. And she came up with an action a day, a kind of action of the laboring of maternity that made this labor of artwork. And I think that's what Gail does a lot of too. She makes artwork when artwork is not there. Chasing after her sons and taking her picture even when he tells her not to. Uh, and so Natalie, uh, at this point, her son was very young, so there were certain actions that they did, and they did them together, and it was making this act of caregiving, which was incredibly overwhelming to uh, Natalie and to her um, collaborators, as artwork. And so once you make it artwork, it can become something else. Um, next slide, please. So this is Alejandra Herrera Silva. Um, these are two performances. The one on the right was done in Finland, and she always works with these substances and generally references her identity as a Chilean who was born during the Pinochet dictatorship. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a piece that um, Alejandra did um, in conjunction with Natalie's last iteration of new, mater new maternalisms. Um, and now that the title of the piece has gone right out of my head, so I, I apologize. Um, but in any case, she is referencing the dictatorship, breaking crockery, spilling things, and then cleaning it up. So she uses the idea of maternal labor as a way of addressing larger issues around the, the social health, which again, I see Gail doing a lot of that and taking there's always a sort of tension between the kind of particular that Gail's addressing and a larger issue around social equity. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is Courtney Kessel, um, who this is also uh, this is uh, was also in uh, New Maternalisms, where she has done this ongoing about 15-year project with her daughter Chloe. It started out when Chloe was very little. This is in 2011, and they basically took all the stuff that Courtney used to keep Chloe going during the day, so Courtney had nothing in her house, and she kept piling it onto the teeter-totter until they could balance, and basically Chloe also had to end the performance. So the final iteration that she did of this, Chloe is now going to college and no longer needs the stuff because she balances her mom. But I, again, like to stress the kind of the stuffness of maternity. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, Marty Kotak, I had to throw her in. If I'm talking about labor, who other than Marty Kotak, who made artwork out of her labor and delivery of her son, Ajax. Next slide, please. And then this is Claire Qualman, who also felt very isolated. She's a walking artist. She organized a pram parade in 2012, but they also, that sheer kind of volume of mothers with pram, she's British, um, is quite overwhelming. And they, they were also ringing bells. I, I'm sure it was not at nap at time. And then the final slide. Um, so this is Lenka Clayton. And if you're not familiar with her artist residency in motherhood, please look her up. It's very, very funny. She started it when she realized that she had no time to sleep. She was always tired. And she needed a residency that addressed what it was actually like to be the mother of young children. So she started one. So they could join the artist residency 
and they could do it on their own at their house. So they would actually have no real downtime to think about work and to make work. Instead, they would be doing this artist residency in motherhood. And she had quite a few participants. And uh, she was recently, I think she is still um, exhibiting at the Carnegie International, which is up through next week. So that's it. <laughs> a little more than 10 minutes, but it was great. All right. And I actually really love being reminded of the women's building excluding children and really trying to put the kibosh on mothers um, right. for, yeah. to protect the idea of woman artists almost equal to men and then mother art starting in response to that saying, wait a second, you've cut out too much from our lives. This is both an important part of our lives and for some of us key to the artwork we're also making as artists and as women and as mothers. Okay, next is Lena, Lena J. Epswal. Um, she's a professor of School of Communications uh, with degrees, a BA in Visual Media and Anthropology from AU here and an MFA in Photography from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art. Um, she's a documentary filmmaker, award-winning photographer, and professor of the School of Communication here at AU in Washington, D.C., where she's the director of the new BA in Photography. Her photography and film work often deals with the intersections of being Indian, meaning South Asian Indian. Ooh, sorry, am I not, sorry, was that not audible? Okay. Um, of being Indian and American and America. The work has been nationally recognized in galleries around the country, including solo shows at the Gandhi Memorial Center and International Visions Gallery. Uh, group shows include the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, uh, hopefully they'll change the name soon, uh, the Washington Project for the Arts, Corporate Gallery of Art, um, Arlington Art Center, Kathleen Ewing Gallery, Lexington Art League, and the Studio Gallery. J.S. Wall has photographs in group collections with the Society for Photographic Education, Multicultural Caucus at the Center for Photography, also in FOCO, Lightwork, Photo Center Northwest, and the Asian American Arts Center. Previously, she has worked for famed photographer Mary Ellen Mark and with the Sandra Berler Gallery. Her award-winning films have been screened in various film festivals around the country. Crossing Lines was picked up for national distribution by META and has been broadcast on over 100 PBS affiliates across the country. The film has won numerous international and national awards, including the uh, prestigious Gracie Allen Award and is currently being distributed by New Day Films. Her latest film, and we're going to see a bit of it, uh, mixed a collaboration with Professor Katie Borum Chatu explores what it means to be mixed race in America 50 years after the historic landmark Supreme Court decision Loving versus Virginia, which made interracial marriage in Virginia finally legal. J.S. Actually in the United States. Oh, it's, 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 yeah. In the United States. J.S. Wall is also working with artist Monica Bose, who was here the last time, a couple of weeks ago, uh, on a feature documentary about climate change called Rising Up to Climate Change, Storytelling with Saris. Jay Swab was one of eight filmmakers to be part of the Futures exhibition at the reopening of the Smithsonian's Arts and Industries Futures exhibition. Jay Swab was the school's first inclusion officer and associate dean from 2019 to 22, ooh, during the hardest times of exclusion no and exclusion. <laughs> Congratulations. You. So you can do your own work again. Yes. yes. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Gail, for asking me to be a part of this. I'm going to spend a lot of my time actually sharing um, some videos of the work that I did, and then we'll talk. Um, so we'll watch maybe these videos, and then I can talk a little bit about um, the connection to Gail's work. So the first piece is just a small uh, one minute. Oh, do you want to, can we show the first one? Yeah, I'm not, it's called I'm Not the Nanny and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. I was at the park one day with my kid and we were having a really great time. We were running around. Can we turn the ball? playing on the swing. Is it the shoes or the Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Only, it's only a minute so hey, and enjoying it. This lady had been observed. Thank you. 
I was at the park one day with my kid, and we were having a really great time. We were running around, chasing each other, playing on the swings, just generally having a really great day and enjoying it. This lady had been observing us, and she finally came over and said to me, you are so good with him. Who do you work for? <laughs> it took me a few seconds to realize she thought that I was the nanny. I said, I work for him. He's my son. She stammered, oh, I didn't know he was yours. He's just so beautiful. <laughs> As I turned away and left, I thought, to these people here, I'm just seen as the help. And when others see my family, I'm seen as a traitor for marrying outside my race. And so then the next uh, piece that I'm gonna just show you is the trailer of my latest film. Um, it's called Mixed, and it's a documentary about what it means to be mixed with two mothers um, going across America in search of what Ask it means to be Ask you a question? Yeah. Describe, sorry. Can I ask you a question? But Describe mommy, what color is mommy? Uh, light brown. Light brown? Okay, what color is daddy? Skin color. <laughs> if somebody said to you, are you black? Are you white? What would you say? Beige. I like that. You constantly have people not understanding where to put you, not understanding like, when you don't fit into any of the buckets that they already know to exist for a certain ethnic group. So it's like either box it would work. I identify myself as South Asian or Indian American. That's how I would identify myself. My family is from the Deep South. Well, Lena and I are both in mixed marriages. Although Lena and I might be very conscious, of race, we obviously don't know what it's like to be a mixed race person. Mm -hmm. So following mixed race stories across America, what are our kids experiencing? Nice to meet you. What's gonna happen to them as they're discovering their identities? Why is a group about biracial identity so valuable for you? People say, oh, I forget you're black. Or I only look at you as Asian. Actually, mommy, you don't say white people, you say the people of not <laughs> Have you tried talking at all? No. Like a handful? No. 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 I think most white families put peanut butter in the fridge. fridge. And black people you don't, you don't, we don't put peanut butter in the fridge. When I was growing up, I thought grace was a bad word. I think it's absolutely necessary to talk about it and not to just like pretend, mm -hmm. you know, that like people don't notice race and people don't notice like multiracial identities. New developments tonight in the death of Tamir Rex, who was shot and killed by a Cleveland police officer. <clears throat> this weighs heavy on me because Elias will start walking to school with his buddies. I looked at my husband and I said to him that I was really glad that my son looked more like him than he did like me because I wanted to use every ounce of his white privilege to protect him. So my husband said the other day, I am fearful of the first time someone calls one of our kids a racial slur. For me as a parent, that's the moment that I dread. Like that is the moment that I know is coming. And Katie and I have never had this conversation with him. It is now here. So I'll start with the, um, the first piece, I'm not the nanny, and I kind of wanted to talk about that in relationship to um, Gail's early work when she was in um, graduate school, because I think there's, uh, there's similar things, there's similar themes there. Um, I purposely, when I was making the cinemagraphs, were showing the labor that I was doing while my son and, my, uh, and his father were able to have sort of the relaxing and the downtime. And it's very similar to me about the serving of the tea and, and, and similar situations there. Um, and that as the role of a mother, no matter what, um, you carry the mental, all of the mental schedules and all of the checklists that you're going off and doing that when, when they get to sort of enjoy themselves. But um, beyond just motherhood and being um, a woman, um, race is a big part of how I process things and do things. And so the racial elements and the things that we've heard, I have done, um, I think my work, I've done a lot of photography, but I'm just sharing some of the video stuff with you all. But um, to me, my work is like therapy. And so if I have some kind of question in my head, it has to come out that way. Like it has to come out through the artwork because that's how I process. 
And so um, when I, the first time, the first of many times that I was called a nanny, I was like, what is going on here? And I live here in DC and it's very clear that the brown women with kids that are not brown um, were the nannies. And so when that kept on happening, I was like, there's something here and why am I feeling, what am I feeling about this? And um, But at the same time, you know, um, in the Indian community, not everybody, of course, I'm speaking in generalizations, but um, I could, they did think I understood Hindi, and so I would hear comments and things of like, I can't believe she married a, a white guy, or you know, like this is the family's going to be messed up, the kid's going to be messed up because um, they don't have the same racial background. And so those things started to uh, focus with also with the documentary, the feature documentary mix. Um, I had a colleague, uh, now a very dear friend, who um, also had mixed children, and she was in documentary filmmaking. And so we said, let's do this. Let's do this together. And at first, it was very much like a hands-off. We were behind the camera. We weren't going to be a part of this. And every time somebody asked us, why are we making this? If they didn't know our families, they said, you know, why are you making this film? Why are you making this film? Well, because our kids are mixed. And we're like, well, that's the story. That's what people want to know. Because without that then it just looks like you're hearing in and you know exoticizing and all the things that we hear happen to our kids anyway. Um, you're doing all of these things without any sense of, of context. And so then we became reluctant characters in the film and we sort of shifted the film and it became about this journey um, of parenting. Uh, so um, I don't want to take up too much time. I did, you know, when watching these and looking at your presentation, it reminded me, you know, so something I've been doing since the day my son was born, he's now 13, is that we've been taking a photograph of him every single day of his life. Now, they're not, it's not staged in a white backdrop or anything like that. Um, and now he's actively involved. And my friend Kim's here in the audience, and she's like one of my, she's like family to us. And when I'm not around, I can text her. Or she's with him, and she'll text me a picture of him. So it's this community of people, like, wherever he is, and now he has his own cell phone, so I will keep calling him and bugging him, and I'll say, send me a picture, send me a picture, and his pictures have changed throughout the time, and when he's, now he's 13, so he's trying to abstract himself, so they're like this close, you know, so I can see an eyeball and maybe a little bit of a nose, and they're fascinatingly different than the way I photograph him. And he's a part of it, he knows this, and so he's a part of this, and I'm just waiting for him to say, no more. Um, and then I'll stop. But until then, I mean, I have stopped about him constantly. Like, send me a picture, send me a picture, send me a picture. And then he'll do it, but he will do it. And I was thinking just in your presentation, why, why, I mean, I understand, like, yes, because I'm a photographer, and so of course I was gonna document him, but then why do it every single day and still now have him and others do it? And I think for me, it's this, it, it's this moment to erase the guilt that I have as a working mother and a gone mother who makes films and is not always here and um, who spends a lot of time in the office and a lot of time with her um, with her students, uh, that there's this just this 30 seconds, 10 seconds a day that I get to connect with him that later on in his life that I hope alleviates my guilt of being a working mother and that he knows at some point, like every single day, there's been just one time when we could connect like that. And so just seeing the work that you were showing, it was like, oh, I didn't even realize that this is actually another practice. To me, it was just like, well, I'm a photographer and I'm his mom, so I want to do this, but it's actually maybe a little something more I need to think, think about. But that just, you know, I look at um, Gail's work of her son here, this just looks like my son's real. I mean, there's just so many things that I couldn't think of that would be so relatable. Um, and uh, especially with the, taking the photograph of a day, but like what changes? And what we might not see, you know, in this picture, July 7th, but then uh, when we get to July 31st, there, it's just more, there's just more stuff. Or even August 7th and July 31st, there's some repetitiveness. How much pizza can a young guy eat, you know, in here? And then you get the moments of like, sort of like the quieter moments, like July 25th. And so it's the changes that happen so subtly. And I think in this process of taking a photograph of him every day, I don't see him aging, but when I look back at those photographs from the beginning of the month to the end of the month, I can see that shift. 
I think it's also interesting to think about seriality and the, the artists that have taken an everyday photograph no matter what and I think that that's it's not just a shift but it's it becomes a kind of conceptual exercise like you stay in you keep your your bow to your performance which I think often gets overlooked if it's a mother taking the photographs but that's Gail's going in and setting up all this you know this camp this is a uh, photographic equipment to take this picture of what's a you know very messy room and so so, but it then it did begin, so it, it reminds me of like Eleanor Anton taking oh, pictures yeah. every day of yes. herself with the fasting, yes. But the diet was hard, so she wasn't, it was, she wasn't actually fasting, she wasn't doing anything, you know, that was sort of spiritual about the fasting. It was just, just a crash yeah. diet artwork. Yeah. She was just targeting herself, yeah. where a sculpture show was with me. And yeah. that somehow escapes the kind of non art connotations, partly because she didn't have any children involved in it. And so I think it's I think it's a very interesting thing to think what happens when a child is involved and what you immediately get kind of boomeranged into or siloed into when that happens. Yeah. Thank you. I also think is this on? Yeah, I also think it's interesting um, that when you had this encounter in the park, your answer was I work for him. So it is also acknowledging the work of the love of raising a child. But it's work, yeah. <laughs> as we all know. Yeah. It wasn't just, I'm not the nanny, I'm not who you think I am, but I work for him. Yeah. Um, so it's both devotion and it's labor. Yes. Okay, we're gonna go on to um, our absent presenter, uh, Andrea Liss, PhD. Um, she, she, she is retired, but she was the contemporary art historian and cultural theorist at Cal State University San Marcos, down in North County, San Diego, where her teaching focused on feminist art and theory, photographic theory, and representations of memory and history. Can we have the, here, these are her two major books. Her most recent book, Feminist Art in the Maternal University of Minnesota Press, came out in January 2009. She also published Trespassing, through shadows, memory, photography, and the Holocaust, also with Minnesota in 1998, as well as numerous book chapters, journal articles, and exhibition catalog essays, including in the M1. Mm -hmm. Dr. Liss curated the exhibition Real Mothers Film, Video, Art, and the Maternal at California Center for the Arts in Escondido, also in North County, San Diego. <coughs> because of family ob obligations with an elder mother-in-law. Um, she sent me this to read, and I'm quoting now, find attached the short text. I opted for shorter, although my mind was buzzing with attention to Gail's diverse maternal work, as well as differences in purpose and aesthetic between her work and those of other feminist mother artists. I enjoyed the opportunity to take another look at and think further if only touched on the portrait of her boys. Can we have the next slide? Concerns that I had. I did not see the portraits that she shows these two reproduced in the catalog. Um, and that is true. Uh, but I'll go on with her notes and then uh, try to defend myself as the <laughs> editor of the book. As a deeply engaged researcher and chronicler of cultural history, Gail Rebin's photography and mixed media artwork observe, comment on, and critique social formation, past and present, ranging from the politics of city planning close to home in Washington, D.C., to the politics of care within her own family. Her coaching critiques are laser focused on the structure of systems, often racist and sexist, that create and perpetuate unjust relations among citizens. Gale's work signals that adherence to such systems produce and reproduce normalized and unquestioned cultural beliefs. Her, per her perceptions are especially acute and especially poignant in relation to these concerns within the realm of the maternal wry, witty, and always aware of deep layers of social hierarchy, Gail's maternal artwork articulates a decidedly feminist approach 
through her active observation and attended cultural analyses of the ways her two boys made sense of the prescribed social order, especially in relation to gender and the representation of women. A case in point, and one of my favorite of Gail's maternal pieces, is published in her artist book, Mother Son Talk, which is here displayed, and we have some pages from it over there, and it's even on sale in the gallery desk, bookstore, whatever. Um, a dialogue, mother son talk, a dialogue between a mother and her young sons from toward false patriarchal concept about women's inferiority in relation to men. And Gail, do you want to read this or shall I? The whole family is riding in the car. Do you want to read My six-year-old is perplexed by a song he heard on Sesame Street. The song says that girls can grow up to be anything they want. My son says, that is not true. I brace myself for a sexist comment. My husband and I exchange glances. Then my son says, that's silly. Girls can't grow up to be a tree, a house, or a car. I agree that women can't be those things. But I reply, men can't be those things either. I know, responds my son, I'm relieved. <laughs> so that's in mother-son talk for any who want to spend more time with it or give it to a, a young parent. <coughs> because it really plays with this old idea of kids say the darndest things from Art Linkletter, but here with a kind of feminist, socially oriented riposte to uh, what kids are saying, asking more questions about why you think this, where does this come from? Despite these risks, her son's innocent and logical reasoning triumphs. I'm not sure I would agree with it triumphs. In, in some ways, I think that Gail's answer triumphs in this moment, though of course it will come up again. In 1997, Gail produced several untitled black and white photographic portraits of both her sons. Actually, it's just... Yeah, well, they're actually, um, the pictures are in color. She said black and white, but they're in color. And they're the ones that are displayed there. The maternal stance of this lovely portrait is articulated differently than its orientation in the previous series. Here, maternal observations are stilled, reverent, becoming facets of a maternal gaze. She pictured her older son from the back, focusing on his furry hairline that softly extends down his neck, bedecked with the rope and metal of his necklace. His close-up figure occupies the entire space of the photograph which Gail framed with a blurred landscape in the background. A doubled sense of wonder occurs here as the mother observes her son in his own reverie. In an untitled portrait, guess the other, yes, uh, of her younger son, also from 1997, Gail created a contemplative contemporary genre scene replete with luscious chiaroscuro light and the delicacies of a morning meal reminiscent of an 18th century European still life and genre painting. As in the other photograph just discussed, the scene also holds a doubled sense of wonder as the mother observes her sons in his own still moment, stilled moment of concentration. In these two portraits, Gail created for herself and by extension for other mothers, a maternal gaze akin to Audre Lorde's sense of the erotic. Lord's revolutionary reconception of the erotic for women means we can claim our own well-being and sensuality untangled from the false and demeaning phallocentric representations of women. These photographs allow Reb, Reb Han, sorry, a maternal gaze to lavish in her boys' sensuousness and to delight in their respective senses of their developing personhood. Her maternal photographic gaze is a quiet celebration and a caress. 
a day later after I got this, I write, thanks so much, Andrea. I write after only a fast skin and sense of profound purpose in being able to re read your wise take. I share it with Gail so she can pull those images which were not in the catalog or the exhibit. Now I may have to explain why I chose other works. Good challenge, ha huh? um, A day later, Andrea replies, Sally, I'm glad the short piece works. Gail has produced many important images related to motherhood, so you had to make curatorial decisions. However, if you have the mind space to reflect on your choices, the audience and I will be interested. Okay, so now it's my turn to respond. <laughs> um, uh, no matter what the critics of feminism and other so-called woke movements may say rather slyly, there is no feminist orthodoxy or hegemony. So here's my response to Andrea, starting with one image. Can we have the next? Okay, first of all, you see that Gail and I were working in really a quite small space for trying to span to really give a sense of the breadth and diversity of her own work over 40 years. Um, so many things had to be cut simply because there wasn't enough space, and I kept saying, I don't want this to look like a jumbled attic sale. This is supposed to look like an exhibition, and we're working with this space. So that was my curatorial. Yeah, I think your mic's off. Just closer. Just closer. Here, why don't you take mine? Sorry. I might have run out of juice. These are battery operated, right? Sorry. Um, it does have a red light on it. So no matter what the critics of feminism and other so-called woke movements may say slyly, there is no feminist orthodoxy. Andrea has been an eloquent spokesperson, spokeswoman, for um, the erotics in maternal relation and the importance of those erotics. And while I think that's an important position, for me, my interest in Gail's work was, as Jenny first brought up, very much about issues of time, time taking over. Is this still working? Or it is working, right? Okay, uh, time taking over, uh, the labor of parenting, of focusing on very needy, demanding children from uh, really their first gasps and yelps, um, and constantly needing caretaking. And uh, it seemed to me that it was, and she comes from a labor background. Her father um, started strikes as soon as he arrived in this country as a teenager and kept going for the rest of his life as he rose in the international labor movement. Uh, as I've written about in the catalog and suggest in relation to, as Gail's work also suggests here, where by the end of his life he's even invited by both Golda Meir and the Pope uh, to come meet them. Um, so, so she comes out of this labor background and then brings that to really speak about the labor of parenting. And it seemed to me that's what's very distinctive, though not completely exceptional, as Jenny has pointed out, in Gail's work very early already as it's somewhat both in dialogue with and opposed to Mary Kelly's work on the creation of a kind of autonomous entity as opposed to an entity that is constantly needed, as I think you see in all of the work here, and then is reprised when she deals with caregiving with her ailing father at the end of his life. So um, I, uh, so that became the theme. Perhaps I should have tried to vary it with these quite loving pictures that she made, though Gail will also speak about it in a minute, as we already planned. Um, but it seemed to me that the erotics of parenting or the romanticism of parenting is a somewhat old theme in the depiction of women and their children, both in Western art, but also in the shorter history of photography. Uh, which, well, now it's coming on two centuries, but that's still pretty short. So I introduced here Gertrude Casevere's iconic, and it really is a canonical image now, uh, Blessed Art Thou Among Women from 1899, that has a certain kind of nascent feminism in terms of the young daughter going off to be educated at a time when upper-class women are beginning to consider careers 
and I don't know what happened with this particular daughter, but um, the woman staying at home still wearing a kind of white negligee um, house dress, not part of the public sphere at all. And it seemed to me that those works which were not yet fully in a series could be much, as much <coughs> linked to a genealogy from this image. So that's why I made the decision as curator when one had to make many choices. We had to actually cut a fair amount of the public history here uh, as well, um, not to include it. But it seemed to me that while the work is about work, it's very much about work that is linked to love, that is always, that these are loving pictures, but they're pictures constantly reminding us it isn't only love, it is a great deal of work as well. I hand it over to Gail, and then all of us can talk and open it up with you. Thank you. And thank you, Andrea, and I hope you can tolerate my response. <laughs> She's going to see a recording of this. In the photographs that uh, Andrea talks about, the reason I took the picture, you can go back to the one with this, no, the other one. The reason I took that picture is that I thought it, the lighting was very beautiful, the situation was very beautiful, but to me the key was that there's a remote control on the table. And that he's watching TV. It's, it's very contemporary, it's, it's, you know, it's junk, it's contemporary life that's mixed in with the tradition of eating breakfast. And I wouldn't have taken it um, without that remote control in there. So that was, to me, key. And in the other picture, if you want to go back, um, it's the necklace, uh, which is like a cheap kind of necklace. And it just, I mean, part of this is maybe my stereotypes, but it was interesting to me that my son wanted to wear a necklace and that he, you know, and that he was wearing the necklace. I mean, I didn't think he's beautiful. And I, I, I do, there is a certain amount of the sensuousness in there that Andrea talks about, that certainly is in there, but I wouldn't have taken a picture without those evidence of contemporary life, of what was contemporary at that time. Although I do love the way the remote control looks very old now, and, 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 and that, that kind of necklace that boys now don't wear. Um, but that was the uh, ultimate fashion at that time. And I'm so old, in my 70s, that I still don't, does it work? Then I still don't remember the names, remotes. I still call it gizmos. Um, <laughs> I just, what, is, what do we call this? People go, it's remote. I go, oh yes, the gizmo, uh, whatever. But um, I, I actually had not noticed um, the remote there. I, I suppose I was stuck on the jam and the toast. Um, I didn't notice it as much. But it is part of Gail's humor. And if you do pick up this, look at this book here, or look at, the, um, the mother-son talk that's still available in the shop um, or at the desk, you'll see that she's constantly thinking about her um, loving, but sometimes trying to control or correct relation to boys that are increasingly enamored of television, as well as what they're picking up in school, some of which is correct and some of which is wacko. And um, so she's constantly trying to counterbalance while recognizing this is not a dyadic relationship since infancy, pretty much. This is actually me playing ping pong with all these other influences and trying to keep their heads screwed on straight. Um, they'll also recognize that once in a while the TVs can be teaching the boys things. Um, there's a, for, for me, my favorite page in Mother Son Talk is when she talks about her concern with her younger son about that he was not learning feminine pronouns. Everything was he, he, his, and him. And she even consults her, her pediatrician, like, what's the matter? Is this a sign? There's something seriously wrong? The pediatrician goes, just be happy he's using any pronouns. And then, but she's still concerned. She's actually now in a house with three males, two boys and her husband. Um, but suddenly she hears her boys who have been watching TV, sports TV, because Turns out her husband loves sports TV. Um, and they're looking at sequined female wrestlers on sports TV, and the son is screaming, they're her wrestlers. He doesn't get it right, but he is like um, jumped over into female programs. So it's also 
saying it isn't just Sesame Street from this other stuff. Sometimes they get other kinds of shocks, some of which can be positive. Um, so there's this constant sort of juggling of the many different influences. And, and oh, yeah, that, that, that's true. And in another sub talk, to talk about some of what you talk about uh, in this, is uh, growing up in DC, the, the kids are very aware of race. They, they notice how people look different. And so there's several pieces about that. And I think it's something that white families have to deal with as much as um, people of any ethnicity have to deal with. And um, the, the one piece that's hanging in the show is called Majority Black, and it's my son talking about, um, you don't necessarily notice when you're in the majority that he is going to an elementary school that is primarily white, and he's going to go to a junior high where he'll be in the minority, and he just is talking about this very rationally. He says, well, I'll just have to get used to it, um, which is, is something that um, I think people don't talk about that much, and I was always talking to him about that, or there's a piece in, in the uh, book called Black's Welcome, where he's, we're in a, in a neighborhood in DC that's primarily black, and my son, he's very innocently just asking questions and trying to make sense of our society. He says, what is there, a sign that says Black's Welcome here? Why are there so many blacks here, not in other neighborhoods? And it's like such a complex answer that in that case, I don't really answer that question very well. Um, because I'm driving, I'm overloaded, but I think it's something that that you have to um, deal with. Everyone has to deal with. And I try, so I try to deal with all those issues, but with a very sort of light touch in the work. But still allowing when you don't have the answers. They don't come too easily, and they're such complex issues. They're all fading. Um, they're all fading, but they're such complex issues that it's not always possible. I mean, this isn't like fairy book family life. This is really trying to talk about all the awkward issues that if you encourage a child to bring up, sometimes it is too complicated, especially if I'm driving. But, um, but it's too complicated even if you're not driving. How do I explain about segregation, about redlining, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of how we get to a fundamentally still segregated post-segregation, but still segregated city. Especially if it's age appropriate, that they can understand um, what this is. But I think if you talk to children seriously, they have really profound things to say, and they really are observing everything. And they observe what society's values really are, as opposed to what we say they are. And they just cut to the chase, like your, like your son did. So, so there's a scene in the film um, where I'm asking him a little bit later, and it was a five-year filming period, and I, you know, I said, do, do you do you have any issues in, in elementary school? Like, does anybody talk about race or you know, um, or the color of people's skin? I was trying to again do the age-appropriate thing, and he said, no, they just talk about what color crayon we should use. <laughs> so, uh, so again, I was like, okay, you know, that's. Fair, you know, fair enough. So, um, and you're, you were reminding me of another story uh, because because I was um, the school's the university's first inclusion officer. I talk about race a lot, and um, I talk about it a lot in my house and everything. And there was a, a point where we were driving, and um, uh, at that time we were living in Petworth, and we were one of the first, um, uh, unfortunately, gentrifiers to come into the neighborhood. And it was still very, very much a black neighborhood. And um, we were driving, and um, we stopped. And my son said, "Why are you, why are you stopping?" And there were three kids crossing the street, and they were um, going to play basketball. And, and I said, "Well, just to let the kids cross the street." And he said, "The two black boys and the one white boy." And I was like, "Why? Wait, 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 how, how do we talk about this? It's not. We don't want to be descriptive, but you know, but, but yes, there were two. You know, and then I was like, "Wait, they're all black boys." And then I said, "What do you mean?" And he repeated himself, and I said. Well, honey, what, what does that mean? And, and he said, the two boys wearing black shirts and the one boy wearing a white shirt. And, I, and uh, his dad looked over at me and just started laughing and said, this is all you, you know, because this is what you do. But because of that, we actually have a fairly open relationship at this age that he can ask me any question. We talk about race, he makes missteps, I make missteps, we both talk about what those missteps are. 
And as Gail, I just am so glad that you said this, the one thing that in the film that we hope that people will get is that this is not just people of color having to talk about race with their children, but it should be everybody talking about race with their children at, at, at age appropriateness. Yeah. The story that you just told about your son with the white shirts and the black shirts reminds me of a piece in Mother Sue Talk where my, oh, there, oh, we had an orange cat and a black cat, and my son said he prefers the orange cat over the black cat, and then he goes, is that racist? <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like, oh, maybe I'm overdoing all this. I want to open this out. Questions from all of you. You should probably hand the one working microphone. <laughs> I think you just have to have it really close to your mouth for it to work. Yeah, let me see if I can get that one working. Sally. It's like, no, it's red, that's why. <coughs> I'm telling you. Now it's green. Oh, okay, good. I think it's bulky. It's sort of on and off. Yeah, see, mine is blinking with no bars. And Wait, one sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Try it. First question, yes. please. I'm not a mother. Some of you are mothers, parents, some of you are not. Uh, feel free to ask questions. And also, uh, all of you are interested in the arts or you wouldn't be here, please feel free to ask questions. I'm so glad that Jenny brought up the issue of when the women's building first opened, they excluded children and really wanted no identification with maternity. Yeah. Please. Hi. Um, I am the mother of a four-year-old, I'm a writer, I have a lot of friends who are scholars and artists, and something we talk about is like how it feels to be interrupted by your child when you're working, and how it, it almost hurts like being woken up sometimes, or what? like trying to switch gears. And I wonder what, how you sort of think about interruption in terms of your process, particularly if you're working on the subject of motherhood, does that sort of solve the interruption problem or does it complicate that experience as you're working on your children while also sort of doing a doing work that isn't necessarily for them or with them even if it's about them that's a great question thank you well, i remember sometimes working um all day even when i when my kids were at school and i wasn't really seeing them but I was working on my artwork, and I felt like I'd been around them all day, even though I really hadn't been. Um, but uh, it, it is a way of uh, bringing you down to reality. Like, uh, for one, one example, um, when I was teaching, I used I had a student show, and I was I brought my kids with me because sometimes you know they have to do that, and. My, my son says to me, so I'm telling the students where to hang the work and what works better next to another. But my son says in a very loud voice, so the whole class can hear, why are they listening to you? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously at home they don't. <laughs> next question. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I'll just um, answer a little bit. Um, so I find those interruptions to be the parts that I can, you know, some, not all the time, but some of those, in those interruptions is where I can get inspired uh, about something else. And um, what I have done, uh, you know, my, um, my son and I, even though he's only 13, we have this really, um, I think, adult relationship. Uh, and he's, you know, I left him at home today and, I, and he said, where, what are you doing? And he said, I'm speaking on a panel, he knew exactly what that meant. I said, do you want to come? And he said, your mind, you know, like, no, of course not, I'm not going to do this. But he comes to work with me all the time. He's posed as a model for my students when it's spring break and I don't have any place to take him and he comes in and we're doing studio lighting. And so they're like, can we take his picture? I'm like, do you want to take it? And then he's like, love, you know, he loves it. And because I've given him a camera, and he shot, he's credited as a cinematographer on our film um, because he shot film. So he's getting, he, he understands what I do, and he, I think in some parts, like gets it, that it's okay for you to have this part of you, because you'll come, when I need you, you'll be there. So you can have this time, and I understand why you're doing it. Um, he watched, when the film premiered, he sat behind me, and he like, there was a scene where I get a little, almost crying, and he just reached over and grabbed my shoulder, 
And at the end of the film, he looked at me and he said, and this is better than any critic, he said, thank you for making this film for me. And so after that, I was like, I'm done. I don't have to do any more work for the rest of my life. You know, I'm done. Like, I've got his approval. And he's in it. And we, but also, um, we very, we're very, very conscious about a kid starting kindergarten and then a 13-year-old, right? So we were very protective in how much we put in about our, our kids. And that's something, that, that line, I, I, want, and I want to ask you, Gail, like, you know, um, that line comes in my head all the time. Am I, I'm being exploitative because I don't know if he's giving me permission because he doesn't know, right? The whole Sally Mann thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about that a lot. And now that he takes his photo and sends it back to me, I know that he's giving me permission. But Gail, like, what was your experience with you know, work with your family, especially as your son's gotten older? Well, I did always show them the work before I would exhibit it anywhere. So I felt like I got permission that way. You know, I would show it to them. Um, with the book Mother Sue Talk, uh, I donated it to, a, at first they, they loved the book. They really loved the book. And then when they were in junior high, um, I wanted to donate it to the school auction. And I asked my son if I could do that. And he said, he thought about it. And then he said, well, that's OK, because only the adults are there. And none of my friends will see it. Um, and then with this, with this uh, work that I did the room series, I, I photographed his room when he was at work. He didn't know I was photographing his room. But at the end of the summer, after I'd all put it together and figured out what I wanted to do, I showed it to him and I said, I did some work about you this summer. And his face was totally white. And um, then when I showed it to him, he just burst out laughing and he said it was fine to show it. And he helped me carry it to the gallery to show. And his one condition was that the girlfriend that he had at the time, he said, don't invite her mother to the opening. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Yes, please. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, I was thinking, um, I have kind of two observations. You know, someone who's been working in the arts for my whole adult life, um, well, for one thing, uh, you make economic decisions when you become an artist, and you are having to buy material and you're having to raise children. And I think that that, like in my situation, living uh, as a European American person, a white person, but the class situation is something I think is really important to consider too. I mean, race, class, and they often overlap. Um, so if you could address that or you know just anything you might think about that and also another thing um, we're as the mother of two sons now grown you know four grandchildren um, we're we're always in relationship to that even if you lose a child you know you're always in relationship to it it's always affecting what you do what your subject matter is um, kind of your stance in, in life, really. And so I think, you know, back to those early days, which are really, were really hard. Like they'd take a nap and you would just like have an hour to paint or an hour to write, whatever. And, um, you know, that was difficult. But in a way, when they become older and, you know, it becomes much more complicated. But it's still, and I think, yeah, you could probably speak to this. Um, it, it really still does affect your work in a very real way, a deep way. So that's it. Well, in terms of the economics, I, uh, I didn't expect to make a living selling my artwork. Um, and I taught uh, at the college level. And so it would have, I mean, I freelanced in doing photojournalism for three years before I went to graduate school. And I really didn't like the way the work I was doing to get paid was affecting my artwork. I started doing like this abstract stuff. It's stuff I'm not really interested in, but just because I was so sick of photographing people all the time for money. So, I, and I knew that if I put a big emphasis on trying to find a gallery, it would affect my artwork in some way. So in terms of the, the economics, I was, uh, you know, making a living doing teaching, and then I had the summers off. And the summers off was when I was really 
able to get most of my work done. I would take notes during the academic year, but I didn't have time to execute anything really during the ac academic year. I just an observation how you're always in relationship to this. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think what you said about that you work out these issues in your artwork, that is yeah. what I do, and whatever I'm obsessed with, that's what I am making artwork about the time. So. Um, well, I guess about the uh, class issue, I'm in a very similar situation, uh, but we, we were, I'm zero generation, so I was not born in this country and um, came here, and so, um, it's a luxury, right? It's a it's a luxury to be able to do this. And I very much like Gail. When I was in, um, I finished my undergrad. Um, I I am a person because of my background because we came here with nothing and we um, lived very poorly for a few years until um, things took off for my family. Um, I always have to have a paycheck coming in. And it doesn't matter what that money is or how much it is, I just have to know what it is and then balance accordingly. So that has always been, that immigrant mentality has always played a part of um, how I have worked. And um, when, uh, when I was going through the tenure process, um, my son's dad was going and getting his bachelor's degree. So we were really on one income and just living there and I had to do work to get tenure so, and we all know how expensive the, this material was, and it was just, you, we just buckled down on everything else. I mean, there was really barely, that, you know, the bare minimum of doing things. And again, I have the luxury of being able to come to work and do my lab, you know, work in the lab space there. It's a real privilege, that, and I recognize that, that that has afforded me that. But at the same time, the pressures of going through the tenure process and becoming a full professor, um, those are the guilt moments of like, do I, am I putting myself ahead of what my family's needs are? And so you, I don't know what the answer is, you know, and I don't know if there is a right way of doing it. Um, I don't think so. Right. Yeah, and, and everybody's situation is a little different, but, uh, but for certainly, and it probably in 10 years when my son, or five, four years when he leaves, for <laughs> four years from now, um, I will probably have a whole another cats in the cradle guilt moment of did I put my work ahead of me, uh, ahead of him, ahead of our relationship and all of these things and I'm sure there will be a project that will come from that. Um, I was struck by Gail saying that uh, she did abstract work because she was tired of taking uh, photos of people, and it makes me wonder when, when I look at some of these projects, you, you do them obliquely, like taking a picture of the room to say something about your sons, or the woman who did the rocking chair imprints, um, and then other things are very direct, photographs of the people and their expressions, uh, some are a mixture, so my question is, do you make those choices consciously upfront about whether to have some level of indirection or do things directly, or does it kind of grow as you start to take the photographs and think about what you want to say? When I'm taking the pictures, I have an idea about what I'm trying to do, but it, it changes as I'm working on it. And there's the process of taking the pictures and then working on it and then taking more. So it, it's not like it's my ideas are not fully formed. And if I, if I tried to have fully formed ideas, I would be paralyzed, it wouldn't work. So I think that you just have to kind of muddle through it, especially when I'm starting a new project. I don't really know where it's going um, as I'm working on it. But I mean, th this series is as much about male clutter and mass <laughs> society and our disposable society as, as it is about him being really messy, and and I and also like the squirt gun one. I'm really glad Sally chose that to include that one because it, it's like a kid has a squirt yeah. gun, but he's well, obviously also didn't Trayvon not Martin a kid. in Cleveland had an orange squirt gun and he was killed because he. 
So Trayvon Martin, I believe that was, um, was killed in Cleveland because he had an orange squirt gun and when the police came, they thought he had a gun and they shot him. So Michael Rakowitz did a, did a piece for the first front triennial where people donated orange and the overall um, gallery installation was orange from the donations. Did you want to keep talking, Gail? All right. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, the orange guns in almost all of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, each piece I try to, I track one particular object. So in the squirt gun one, I'm tracking the squirt gun and the laptop on the chest. So I'm going to ask, and maybe this is the chicken before, which came first, the chicken or the egg. You're, you're obviously um, interested in the arts. You're going to school for the arts. You're trying to make a career in the arts, and then you make a, a, a life happens. You meet somebody, you decide to have children. Some people decide, actually my sister, who is going um, as a professor at a big university, opted not to have children because she felt she could not do that balance. But she was, but the interesting thing to me is which, so you're an artist, you get married, you add children to the picture. Does your artwork change? Does your focus change? Was your, was your focus maternal before you moved into mother? It, it absolutely changed after I became a parent. I mean, the, the early work is with my husband and his mother. And um, I did work about, about my own house and everything, so it absolutely changed. And I have no idea what kind of artwork I would have done if I didn't have kids. I have absolutely no idea. So I think, for me anyway, all my life experiences um, change who I do, what I do. It absolutely changed the work. Oh, yeah, absolutely for the same. You know, I, my thesis was, uh, in, in my, uh, for my MFA was about arranged marriages, and mine was not an arranged marriage, but um, uh, it was about arranged marriages because I was like thinking about marriage and wondering what that step was going to be, and so that was my thesis, and then um, everything else was is dictated by the issues in my, like literally it's my therapy. You know, it's like what is come, what's in my head, what is happening, and I I wouldn't even understand what it meant to be a mother until I had my son. So I understood what it meant to be a daughter, but I don't understand what it meant to be a mother, and so I couldn't even fathom making work like that we've seen today without. Can I just add one thing? This is going to be quick because I know we're out of time, right, Sally? So you should just be aware that a lot of women who are mothers have never made artwork about being a mother because of the stigma that's associated with that. I mean, those women that do make art, a lot of times the class has been very homogenous instead of heterogeneous. I will leave you with one last example. When Mira Shore and Susan B were putting together their issue of meaning on artists who were mothers, and these were not necessarily artists who made work about motherhood, of uh, several artists asked them how they had found out. Like how they didn't want to be outed at all for being a mother. So uh, when you make this decision, I think it's a little less stigmatized now that you're doing it, but when Gail made this decision, it was one where she knew her work was not going to be recognized as work. It was going to be seen in terms of taking pictures of your family. Uh, and we have a lot of artists, I mentioned Eleanor Anton and Linda Montano, who did this kind of work, but were, I think Eleanor Anton was a mother, but I have no idea. Yes, yes, yes Sally knows all these people. Um, and it was just so hidden. Anyway, here you go, Sally. Oh, you have one that works too. Yeah, I Oh, okay. Really? Um, back to your question about relations. It's. I think it's a great question that was previously asked, that was more recently asked about how did you know what you were going to do as a mother, as an artist. Um, but it seems to me, if you look at this earliest work, though there is some work before the earliest work on view here, it's very much about family relations. And so it's very interested in the question of human relations. And if you look at some of the most, the latest work, which is the self-portraits as an aging woman, um, it, it isn't just self-portraits, though there, there are many women who do lots of self-portraits nowadays, 
But um, instead, from the beginning, Gail said, it has to have a line of these words below. So it's thinking about these relational dynamics between self and other societal standards and how the self is trying to maintain itself at the same time. So it seems to me there's a continuity about the issue of constantly thinking of these relations in this work. There is one more. Good, one more question. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was, it's not so much a question as a comment. Um, I'm a painter, not a photographer, and I don't know whether that's a distinction, but Jenny, you said something about people, women not a, having motherhood as a subject because of a stigma, and I guess I kind of need to dispute that, <laughs> because I know many, many, many hundreds of women artists in the Washington, D.C. area, and I don't think it has anything to do with their topic. Now, photographers may be different because it's a year kind of, you know, in the world around you. But I think there are, you know, painters, maybe sculptors who do things that are like totally abstract or, you know, just really have no relation. And it wasn't anything about a stigma about, you know, their families or not wanting to be known as a mother or anything like that. So just putting in a, a, word, a word for mothers. I mean, and women artists. This is the beginning of the And painters. This is a larger discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I just want to say something. It really was taboo when I started doing this work. And even to be an even to be an artist and a mother, there's this whole myth of the solitary artist who devotes their entire life to their artwork. And the artwork is the most important thing. And it's like they don't have any other life to them at all. And so when you become a mother, you're obviously, I mean, if you are a caring mother, which most mothers are, uh, you know, you're saying something else is important to me as well. And that is something that in the art world is not considered to be a good thing. And I, I did feel like I was sort of like throwing, because a lot of women did hide, I remember that issue very, very much, and that a lot of women wanted to hide the fact that they were married and had kids, or that they had kids. And it, it, it was um, very controversial. When I'd show this work, I would, I, you know, like not in an exhibition, but in, as a portfolio reviewer to someone, I almost felt like I was bringing all this trash out to them, all this stuff that they shouldn't look at and talk about. And but it was feel some of it had to do with being a photographer and photographing. So, so I said, I'm going to say no, and I could refer you to several writers. I would look at um, Holland and Parker's book on mistresses, and actually Whitney Chadwick has a really kind of nice summary when she talks about the um, abstract expressionists. But the issues around painting abstractly, you could never divorce someone from the culture in which they are imbricated. And so these women went to art school mostly with people who had come back from the war and had entered college with the GI Bill and were trained by male abstract expressionists. And so this emphasis on abstraction was um, very much a way for them to get their work into better shows or for their, so it's, again, it's not just that they sort of didn't want to make work about motherhood or that being a painter sort of exempts you. Of course, painting is obviously a very different medium. But there's plenty of painters that have done really challenging work. Um, Jenny Seville, of course, immediately comes to mind. Um, she has painted both large-bodied women and transgender folks as well. And so it, it actually is a decision. Are you going to be pigeonholed? Um, painting because of what happened with um, HIV AIDS and issues around gender and the culture wars police, which we're experiencing again. Mm -hmm. um, we have, what's that? David, the statue of David. Yes, the statue of David, right. I'm, I'm ready to bring Marta Minwin back and build another pantheon of Ben books. So we're gonna have a whole pantheon of work um, by the time they're done. But in any case, with those particular situations, you still saw, so motherhood is so closely, as I think Sally rather eloquently and succinct, succinctly demonstrated with Kay Spears' photograph, uh, motherhood was so closely associated with a certain kind of middle class ideology. If you think about who gets to be mothers in popular rep representation, it's generally not women of color, BIPOC folks, Native Americans, transgendered folks, queer folks gay and lesbian folks. 
it's generally women in heterosexual relationships that read as white. Um, again, that's very problematic. We don't understand the construction of whiteness and queer. You know, Gail didn't used to be white, now you're white. Um, so that's, and you would think with my last name that I might not have been used to be white either, but that's actually never been the case. I've always been white, and I'm pretty white overall, just <laughs> white. But regardless, that's, that's one of the issues that's sort of coming up. So we assume that artwork, because of the kind of ideological underpinning that reinforces the way in which we understand what we look at, we assume that it's freedom of expression and certainly it was marketed that way, particularly during the Cold War. But that, so you have to look at sort of all the things that go into that, and, and there are actually plenty of women making very, very interesting work about maternity, like Sarah Urban, who's had some really weird reviews because of what her work is about, uh, that work abstractly. She's certainly not the only one, I just cut them out. Meryl actually had a lot in her, her exhibition that um, I cut out because it didn't, it was more personal, it was actually deeply personal, um, and it didn't, I wanted to really highlight the way in which Gail very early on addressed issues around labor, class, ethnicity, race, um, social standards. As well as gender. I'm gonna end this, because I want to allow a little bit of time. These are really great questions. We could go on for another couple of hours, a couple of days, a week or two, uh, camp out here. Um, but I really want to thank you all for coming, and I especially want to thank Jenny Klein, Lena J. Wasoff, and Gail Grimhan, the artist here. And I thank Andrea, too. And no, no, Andrea no, no. Liss. And Carla. And um, I encourage you all to spend some a little more time with the work itself now that you've heard discussions about it and about a larger context of women, feminism, and the debatable issue of the compatibility of art practice and maternity. And um, we can continue discussing this. Thank you.